Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our latest um, Exit of Tehran conversation in philosophy. And uh, today we will be discussing philosophy of religion, uh, which in many ways you could argue is becoming quite a large and significant field um, in the analytic philosophy of religion in North American and uh, particularly British academia. Um, and also it, it's becoming, I think, popular because of its links with some of the concerns of theology, as well as this wider question of what um, contribution do certain people of faith have to understanding um, issues within philosophy of religion, since many of those big questions relate specifically to them, such as the, the existence of God, what does it mean, can God be free, um, can God have emotions? Uh, and many other questions which are not necessarily about God, but also about our cosmos and humanity. Um, so uh, we will have this conversation uh, with our colleague, uh, Mohammed Saidi Meher from Talbiyat Madaris um, University uh, in Tehran. And I will pass it now to uh, Mohsen Fez um, who will introduce uh, Professor Saidi Meher. Uh, thank you, Sajra. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I just introduce uh, Mohamed Saidi Mir, and then we'll pass to Sajjad to begin the conversation. Mohamed Saidi Mir is professor of philosophy at Tarbiyat Badaris University in Tehran, where he has graduated in 2001. Uh, he was a member of the board of directors at the Iranian Association for Philosophy of Religion. Uh, his area of specialization includes logic, Islamic philosophy, and philosophy of religion. Uh, he has published many articles and books, including uh, a book on the nature of necessity and its relation to the possible worlds, which is in Persian. And uh, he has published recently an article on divine knowledge and the doctrine of Bada, which is published in Theological and English. So thank you, Muhammad, for joining us. Uh, and I'm at your steps. I think you are muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mohsen. Uh, hello to everybody. I am so happy to be with you, and it's my pleasure to be in this meeting. And uh, I hope that we will have a very interesting and uh, productive conversation in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, th I thought it would be useful, maybe, um, before we get to, to the sort of big questions, if you could tell us a bit about your career. You know, how did you come to the study of philosophy and particularly how did you come to the study of uh, the philosophy of religion? So that will give us a, a sense of who you are before we can start asking you those questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, I actually, I have a long story uh, in my life. And too, long, too long to be reported here. But after uh, high school, I went for a short time to Imam Sada University for two semesters. I studied uh, at Imam Sada University. But then I felt that I uh, really love to study in the seminaries. And so I came out from that university and continued to study religious studies uh, in first in a seminar in Tehran and then I uh, moved to Qom to uh, continue my study there in the seminary of Qom. And after a couple of years, I felt that I uh, also like to, to, to continue my study in the university. So I got a, an MA in theology and philosophy in Qom. And at the same time, of course, I was um, continuing my study in the seminary. And then I uh, came to Tehran. I got my PhD from Tarbiyat Madaris University. And uh, actually, my first engagement, I can say, with uh, philosophy of religion in uh, its uh, current, you know, usage was when I uh, 
was deciding about my subject of uh, MA dissertation. And uh, one of my friends introduced to me uh, Plantinga's uh, book, God, Evil and Freedom. And I read the book and I decided to work on this book as my MA dissertation. So this was actually my first, uh, you know, engagement with uh, philosophy of religion, but I also studied Islamic philosophy in the seminary and in the university as well, and Islamic theology and other, you know, branches of Islamic sciences like mysticism. And uh, now one of, uh, I can say, one of my main concerns is actually philosophy of religion. And now, as, as Mohsen said, I am a professor at uh, Tiger Madras University. I teach mostly Islamic philosophy, but in some courses I teach in Tarbiyat Mudarras and sometimes outside. In other universities, I teach philosophy of religion as a Yeah. Okay. So um, actually, um, before we go on, um, maybe I can ask you a very obvious question, which yeah. is, uh, apologies for the phone ringing in the background, um, whether you, um, whether you found, given that you've studied, of course, in the, in the Hause as well as in the in, uh, philosophy departments, um, do you think there's a distinction in the conception of what we might call philosophy of religion between the two? Uh, I don't think that uh, there is a, you know, a deep and serious difference between these two points of view. But perhaps uh, the whole ap approaches, you know, are somehow different. Uh, but the whole concept is almost the same. Mm, but, you know, uh, nowadays, as I see in uh, the seminaries, uh, there, uh, there, there is not a, you know, a specific course on philosophy of religion. Mostly the students who uh, are interested in philosophy of religion, they work, uh, I can say, by themselves without, you know, attending any formal course on philosophy of religion. They read the books and they have, have some conversations with their colleagues. And sometimes they try to write some papers, you know. But in, in uh, universities, I think that more than two decades, we started to, to launch some uh, formal uh, uh, disciplines or courses on philosophy of religion. And so the difference is that uh, we can call a student in the university, um, strictly call him a student of philosophy of religion, but uh, on the other side in the seminary, there is no, no such uh, um, uh, fixed, you know, uh, branch or discipline for philosophy of religion. Uh, but maybe we can, uh, but, but maybe uh, we can see in some seminary bay, uh, beside students in house students who are interested in philosophy of religion, uh, there are some seminary based institutions uh, which were established even before uh, philosophy of religion in universities to work on philosophy of religion stuff um, maybe we can, I, I can uh, follow Sajjo's question in, in, a, in, in this way, that uh, is there any difference between seminary-based institutions whose interest is philosophy of religion and the, what is going on in universities? For example, um, I think Pajurish Goy, Farhang Lami, or uh, some other institutions which are mainly based in seminaries. Uh, is there any difference in following up uh, philosophy of religion in, in, in those uh, institutions and that of universities? Yeah. 
it seems to me that one of uh, at least one of the main differences in approach, as I mentioned earlier, I think that there is a little bit difference in the whole approach. Uh, in the seminary-based institutions, as you said, because the attendees, the students, have a seminary background, you know, and all of them or most of them are talabe. You know, in, in, in the seminaries, according to the method of, uh, I can say, learning and teaching, and this is, of course, actually one of the merits, I can say, of education in seminaries, in my view, that the student used to, used to challenge, you know, the ideas to question, to ask, uh, and to criticize, you know, the views. And I think that this is one, uh, you know, uh, important aspect of uh, learning and teaching philosophy of religion in the seminary in general and in seminary-based institutions uh, in particular. Uh, a talab or a student of seminary really likes and tries to criticize and to, you know, have a very active, you know, uh, uh, contribution in the discourse of the issues. And uh, thus we see that many of these students, they have a challenging mind, I, I can say. And we find in some of their writings, their papers that they actually try to, you know, challenge the current views and perhaps, you know, uh, provide or propose new and novel uh, points of view. This is one, I think, important merit or aspect of this approach. In, in the university, we, we, we find this kind of, you know, engagement, but it is not so strong. But at the same time, I think that these challenges, uh, you know, uh, have a flaw, I can say, have, a, have a, an essential flaw. Uh, the flaw is that, unfortunately, I cannot say that all of them, but at least uh, some of them, some of these, uh, you know, uh, students, Talab, uh, some of them actually lack uh, a deep, you know, a deep and profound uh, knowledge of Western philosophy. And because of this, when they start to, you know, to challenge or to criticize, sometimes the result is something that we can call a somehow naive, you know, critic of these views. Because uh, I think a useful and a considerable uh, critic should be uh, uh, based on a deep, you know, knowledge of the basics of the uh, issue. So I think that unfortunately some of these critics have uh, shortcomings because the basics are, are not provided. Can I just comment very quickly on that? I mean, that's quite interesting because, you know, we sometimes have this external kind of perception that it's actually the Hause students who will, we would expect not to be critical and the university students who we would accept to be, expect to be critical. But you're suggesting that the university students are more deferential to the great names than the Jose students are. And um, I, I mean, I think that's, that's really a fascinating point. Yeah, I think that this is actually the case because you know, the mentality of uh, Jose students 
uh, you know, uh, normally is in this way, works in like this way, because even uh, even regarding the Muslim, you know, the figures, a Talabe learns to, to, to be critical. Uh, but what I mentioned about uh, this case uh, was, you know, mostly about Western thinkers, you know, because the current uh, discourse on uh, philosophy of religion is mostly Western and uh, many of the new current issues come from the West. And so these Talab encountered these new ideas. First, they, they feel that they like to read more and more, to know more. But uh, in many cases, I, th I, I, I find that they very quickly, I can say, very quickly uh, enter the phase of, I can say, criticizing these ideas. And this is, from one point, valuable, I think, because philosophy is the area of, I can say, critical thinking and applying critical thought. But from one point, as I told you, I think that a flaw or a shortcoming here is that sometimes we find that the basics of the issue is not provided well. And so the critique is not so profound. Okay. Um, yeah, th this is, I think, a, a, a dichotomy uh, between between the uh, university-based philosophy of religion and seminary-based philosophy of religion. But I think there is also another dichotomy, which is, which maybe is rooted uh, in the establishment of the discipline in Iran. My impression is that establishment of philosophy of religion as a distinct discipline uh, stems from the proliferation of the debates about, uh, about, about religion among public intellectuals uh, during late 80s or uh, early 90s who labeled later as religious intellectuals. Um, those debates were, uh, were um, shaped in a political context and were themselves, in a sense, political in nature. Uh, but after a while, like two decades or so, uh, the discipline uh, has, has been transformed into, in, especially within the university, the discipline has been transformed into some more globalized or even Christianized uh, enterprise in which um, the experts in the field try to contribute to well-known problems in philosophy of religion globally, uh, the nature of God, problem of evil, et cetera, and mainly analytic philosophy of religion, uh, rather than those local problems that were the reasons why made the discipline uh, established. Maybe, maybe there, is, there are some interests still in seminary-based institutions to deal with that problems, uh, which was the reason or motivation to to establish the discipline. Uh, do you, what, what do you think about this? Yes, I think that you are right that, uh, I can say after the Islamic revolutionary revolution in Iran, in the late 60, uh, 60s and early 70s, you find some, as you said, intellectuals, Iranian intellectuals, who try to, in a sense, revise some of uh, Islamic doctrines about the basic beliefs. And uh, due to this uh, enterprise, we witnessed some you know, new ideas published in some magazines or uh, newspapers or journals. And in this phase, uh, I think that we didn't have philosophy of religion in, in, uh, as an academic, you know, uh, enterprise as an academic 
career. But this was actually the beginning and the start of this stream. Uh, the the um, issues at that time uh, can be called at the same time theological issues, not just philosophical issues. But as you know, and I believe in this, that philosophy of religion has a common area of subjects with uh, philosophical theology. So, for example, we uh, had some discussions about, you know, the notion of religious pluralism and uh, other issues like these about the prophethood of Muhammad and about the revelation, but not as an academic, you know, discourse. Instead, these uh, were, uh, you know, published in somehow public magazines or newspapers or journals. So, but after a while, as you mentioned, uh, some of the thinkers in Iran uh, try to, I, I can say, try to um, bring this, you know, stream, be, be, uh, these uh, activities to un the universities. And so we find that uh, gradually some courses former courses in some disciplines called philosophy of religion was were gradually established and launched in several universities in Iran. So I agree with you that the start point in Iran was uh, due to some you know, activities by some intellectuals who mm, were not uh, formal, you know, professors in the university, they, their audience were mostly, you know, somehow public, but gradually this, you know, moved to universities and uh, became some, you know, courses in the universities as philosophy of religion. Uh, yes, we have some uh, historical, you know, change in this respect, I can say. I, I mean, if I can just follow up on that, because I, I remember reading those journals in the mid-90s when I was a student. I mean, I'm thinking of places like Kian, right? Um, yeah. So the, the works of the, you know, the Roshan yeah, Fikron. Excuse me, when I uh, said 60s, I... I yeah, you, you meant 80s. Yeah, you meant yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, I figure that out. Because we, should, we should say 60s and 70s, we're talking about the late 80s or the early 90s uh, in, a, in, in our Eurocentric way of looking at the world. Um, but, you know, I, I think I have no problem with you saying 60s and 70s. And, and I think sometimes, you know, we can have debates on, on calendar and things like that. But um, no, um, what I was going to say is that a lot of the works, and I, I used to have, I don't even know where they are, but I used to have all of these back issues of Kian back in the day. And um, I, I considered a lot of those works to be interventions in political theology and also in social critique. And I think, you know, if you, if I were to ask one of these figures who everyone knows, you know, probably the most famous was Abdul Karim Surush, um, you know, he would probably say that one of the issues with the way in which philosophy of religion perhaps is understood in a very university, very formal, quite conservative way, is over obsessed with the nature of God or is over obsessed with classical theological categories such as revelation, such as infallibility and so forth. And what most people or intellectuals should be doing is not dealing with those issues of, you know, very um, traditional philosophy of religion or even philosophical theology, but they should be dealing with the theological issues which present themselves to most people, right? So they shouldn't be doing kind of high uh, philosophical theology, but they should be engaging with issues of rights, issues of belonging, issues of identity and essence, um, uh, which 
you know, affect the average person in a society and trying to make sense of what it means for someone to be a religious person in a society. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate in a sense and saying that that critique, I think, was quite a useful one to say that maybe the whole um, discipline has become so rarefied that it's divorced from the concerns of the, of the ordinary person. Um, and, and this is often said about philosophy. Sorry for, sorry for going on. But this is often said about philosophy that uh, sometimes the way in which philosophers speak is not terribly accessible. Uh, you know, a philosophers sometimes are not very good at explaining or communicating why what they do is actually of significance to the average person or even the average student for that matter. Yeah, you are completely right, Sajjad, you are right. And uh, I think that we can distinguish between these two, you know, activities. One of is uh, quite, you know, academic and uh, is uh, um, shown, you know, in the university, in the university class uh, with some formal students who have applied, you know, to take part in this class. Uh, and perhaps in this situation, we have to, you know, talk to, to speak about uh, about deep you know and uh, specific issues and sometimes uh, the whole situation is different uh, if, uh, an in intellectual figure is speaking in, you know in a widely for uh, for people in the society in the uh, for even for lay people, you know, and in this form of, you know, talking about uh, theological issues, when you have a um, widespread, you know, atmosphere and uh, audience, you may enter to some, as you said, political and uh, uh, social issues which in a sense have uh, uh, most uh, more significant um, impact on the society and uh, if you have heard uh, nowadays in Iran um, there is a very you know important question about the role of academia in promoting uh, theological issues in a very broad sense, of course, in the society. And some people think that the academia is, has not been so successful in doing this you know, job. Um, because the form of uh, uh, dealing with uh, theology and philosophy of religion, as you said, in the first form very, I can say, somehow private in some classes in the university. And it uh, doesn't have a, a widespread affect on the society. And I think that both of these you know, streams uh, are valuable and perhaps we can uh, evaluate you know, both of them in their own place with their own, I can say, objectives and aims. And we cannot say that one of uh, these is necessary and the other is not good. We should get rid of it. No, both of them are uh, significant and useful, but the aims are, of course, different. Uh, by the way, uh, do you agree with uh, calling those earlier debates philosophy of religion? Because I think it is called now um, in the academy. 
I have seen at least somewhere that it is called philosophy of religion. For example, uh, recently Haydar Shadi has published some work on Abdul Karim Surush, uh, which is called uh, philosophy of religion in post-revolutionary Iran, which is devoted solely to uh, Surush's ideas. Uh, do you agree with this nomenclature uh, to call those debates philosophy of religion, or you think it, it, might, it, it should be some other distinction? Yeah, I think that it depends actually on your, I think, definition of philosophy of religion and what philosophy of religion is, per se. Uh, and it depends on your uh, description or um, definition of philosophy itself. If we find philosophy of religion as a rational, you know, consideration, rational study of um, the religious conceptions and religious principles. We may uh, think of a you know, broad, somehow broad uh, conception of philosophy of religion. And according to this uh, conception, we may agree with the writer to call, for example, Abdul Karim Surush works and ideas as uh, ideas belong to philosophy of religion. Uh, it depends on your definition, I think, and, and perhaps there is no consensus on this issue. We can, we can choose a somehow narrow definition and say that, okay, for example, Surush, uh, sometimes appeals to some uh, uh, to some uh, you know literature from Rumi and other poets that does not you know, uh, relate to philosophy. This is not philosophy. This uh, seems to be like some uh, social you know promotion, uh, social lecture. And this is not philosophy because the method is not so rational. And someone may say, no, no, that's also philosophy. I think that it depends on your picture of the philosophy of religion itself. And there have been also After some all, attempts. I think that the name or the label is not so, you know, Significant. Mm -hmm. The content is significant. Uh, yeah, there, there have also been some attempts to broaden the sense of philosophy of religion within recent years, uh, not not in Iran. For example, uh, Kevin Skilbrack or Thomas Lewis has written some works uh, on on the on the concept or nature of philosophy of religion uh, and and tried to broaden uh, the idea of the concept of philosophy of religion to include some other. Uh, debates on religion, for example, on religious rituals, etc., or on uh, non-Christian religions. Maybe we can um, include these debates also within that umbrella of debates. Yes, maybe. <laughs> As I told you, it depends on your, your your whole picture and how you characterize this branch of philosophy, philosophy of religion. Yeah, and I think that in the Continental philosophy of religion, we, we, we have a very different, you know, uh, situation and perhaps uh, uh, an analytic philosopher, uh, philosopher of religion, when he or she comes to um, continental philosophy of religion, uh, perhaps he or she may judge that, oh, this is not philosophy, this is literature, or this is something like, you know, something different from philosophy. So I think that it uh, really depends on your picture of philosophy itself. I mean, is it the case that most philosophy of religion in Iran is basically analytic philosophy of religion, which arises out of I guess what you would call a Christian context. So, you know, obviously from the beginning, you talked about Plantinga. Uh, Plantinga has become kind of this huge figure 
um, you know, in the philosophy of religion and uh, almost kind of a domineering figure <laughs> in philosophy of religion. And, uh, um, you know, it, it would be interesting to see if there was an attempt to move towards a more kind of diverse or even a global sense of what philosophy of religion is. So, for example, a colleague of ours at Birmingham, um, Eugene Nagasawa. So Eugene Nagasawa wrote this wonderful book called Maximal God, which is of interest to anyone who's interested in, in proofs for the existence of God. Um, but he's got a new, a massive project on a kind of a, a more global philosophy of religion. So he's hired people, he's, right, he's hired a wonderful um, friend, uh, 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 Muhammad Zadipur, um, to work on kind of Islamic approaches to philosophy of religion. He's hired someone in Hindu um, philosophy of religion. So I'm kind of wondering whether there is an attempt also in these academic departments in Iran to try and make those sorts of global links. It's not just to kind of have an intervention within a particular analytic tradition of this, but maybe to actually bring to the debate certain issues which are not traditionally part of um, um, of, um, of sort of analytic um, philosophy tradition. Someone just asked about Zaripur. Yeah, he was in Munich, but he's just moved to, to Birmingham. <laughs> Uh, yes, he was with, with Peter and, and Munich. Yeah, I think that you mentioned two questions, at least in your... Uh, yeah, this whole question of like, uh, um, you know, whether it's really uh, mainly um, analytic philosophy of religion in Iran, which is very much tied to figures like Plantinga, like Haska, some of the reformed epistemologists and so forth. Um, and the second one is um, whether there's an attempt to make this more sort of global connection to produce something new, which you could call a global philosophy of religion, which is not, you know, either narrowly analytic, nor continental, nor kind of, you know, Anglo-American as it's called, or Francophone, or, or you know, German or whatever, um, or even just very traditional Islamic philosophy of religion, which I guess would just be defending like Mullah Sadra or Ibn Sina. Yeah. Okay. Regarding your first question, I think that, uh, of course, as far as I know, as far as my knowledge shows, that uh, during these recent years, uh, the more, uh, you know, prominent, I, th I think, approach to philosophy of religion in its current sense uh, in Iran is analytic. Uh, of course, you know that philosophy, Western philosophy in Iran, uh, I think that for more, for more than three or four decades, or even more than this, uh, was under the, you know, uh, rule, I can say, rule of uh, continental philosophy. Many of the uh, well-known philosophers, uh, Iranian ph philosophers, uh, nowadays they, they belong to the camp of, uh, I can say, continental philosophy, especially in our universities. Uh, and it was just recently that the situation somehow, I can say, changed in my mind and uh, some attempts to, to promote, to introduce and to work on analytic philosophy, Western philosophy in general and analytic philosophy of religion in particular. Uh, some uh, attempts began in Iran and especially in the universities, in the, in the academia and uh, nowadays we have a somehow i can say balance between these two uh, streams but in a, especially in the context of philosophy of religion not in philosophy generally in philosophy of religion i think that at least in the universities which i am familiar with uh, the 
prominent, I can say, approach is analytic. Uh, this is the first point. And the second point is that uh, I am personally uh, believe that um, as, a, as, as someone who likes analytic philosophy, I can say that we cannot get rid of continental philosophy uh, or accuse continental philosophers uh, as non-philosophers or continental philosophy as literature. I think that these are two different um, views, two different uh, approaches to philosophy, which both are valuable in, in their own place. And we should start, begin to have a kind of, you know, cooperation between these two uh, approaches. And I think that actually recently, I, I have seen that the, they have been started some attempts, even in uh, uh, Western countries and Western academia, to make a bridge between these two uh, branches, I can say, of philosophy, and to get continental philosophers and analytic philosophers together to have some, uh, you know, uh, good dialogue and to bring their views um, closer to each other's views. And this is a very good idea that we. Uh, go beyond some limitation and try to uh, look at philosophy and philosophy of religion from a wider perspective and try to have a global you know, approach to philosophy of religion. And the last point is uh, this, that uh, uh, from a uh, Muslim perspective and Muslim philosophy perspective, I think that uh, we have uh, now a very uh, great problem and it is that we, we are not good, we have not been good presented in the international, you know, relation uh, and discourse on philosophy of religion. As you know, uh, and I believe in this, we in, in our uh, philosophical heritage, we have uh, many, many good ideas uh, which can be represented, uh, presented today and introduced and worked on and even criticized and developed as philosophy of religion. But unfortunately, we see that in many texts who, which, is, which are written today on uh, philosophical, philosophy of religion, uh, we see that uh, there is no, you know, talk about Muslim philosopher. Yeah. And uh, it's very bad for, you know, uh, and in general, we have some problems because uh, if today someone asks about uh, international figures who work, for example, on Avicenna or on Al-Farabi, you see that uh, 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 Many who work actually on these Muslim philosophers, they are not Muslim and they are not Iranian, they are not Arab, they are from West. This is not a bad point, it's very good. But the bad point is that we as Muslims, we as Iranians, we as other Islamic countries, we are actually absent in this, you know, area. And I hope and I really think that we need to, to a very strong, you know, I can say, attempt 
to change the, this situation, to change this balance. You know that someone like William Craig, who is a well-known philosopher of religion, Christian philosopher of religion, he, some years ago, he worked on uh, Al-Ghazali's argument for the existence of God and introduced it, of course, in the uh, new language uh, using the uh, new terminology and new uh, uh, conception of, you know, many uh, uh, yeah, uh, and he introduced it as Kalam argument, and now you find in many, many books uh, a chapter on or a section on Kalam argument. And the amazing point is that in our uh, philosophy, many you know many of our philosophers didn't care about this argument. They thought actually that this is not a valid argument, Kalam argument, and they criticized this argument and proposed, at least according to their own view, proposed better arguments like Sertirin argument and the argument based on necessary, and etc. So this is a uh, uh, evidence that we have a, a very rich you know, uh, heritage on philosophy in general and on, you know, in many philosophical if, texts, ancient texts um, from Avicenna, Al-Farabi, Mullah Sadra, we have an, a specific chapter on Rububiyat or Elahiyat um, al Al-Akhas or the similar, you know, terms and these issues actually concern what we nowadays call philosophy of religion. So uh, I hope that uh, we in, in the near future we can try and change the situation and uh, to present ourselves and our ideas for our Western colleagues and enter to a very productive uh, conversation with them. I mean, just one small thing on that before I go to more simple last question and then we'll open it out. Um, I mean, it seems part of this is because of the, the inheritance of, um, of Christian philosophy of religion. So it seems to me that there are two major strands within it. One is the reformed strand which of course includes people like Craig. And the reform strand is still heavily influenced by Calvinism. And then you have the analytic Thomists, right? So the analytic Thomists are still around. And um, in many ways, the analytic Thomists, I think are much broader in the sorts of issues that they are interested in discussing. Um, of course, even further, if you want to go further, you've got the analytic Orthodox school. So people like Aristotle, Papa Nicolau, et cetera, who I find far more interesting because if I'm going to be kind of personal about it, I find those orthodox ideas about religion and theology far more kind of consonant with Shi ideas than, than any other um, schools within Christianity. Um, I, think, uh, I think Mohsen has a, a, a final question maybe and then we'll open it up. Yes, uh, we, had, we had like the same conversation, uh, like the same discussion in our session on Islamic philosophy um, that for, for the most part, what has been done uh, in, in that, that put co in conversation the uh, Islamic tradition or Islamic tradition of philosophy with uh, the Western tradition or non-Islamic tradition um, has, has been done within the context of analytic philosophy. Um, do you think if it is the best framework in which we can uh, put in conversation uh, or, or uh, the, the Islamic uh, philosophy, the Islamic philosophical tradition, or the philosoph philosophical theology, or even theological ideas, or is there some other uh, routes that, that we can uh, have to put these uh, different traditions in conversation? Yes, I actually think that analytic approach is 
overall a useful, interesting, and very you know productive approach to philosophy of religion, even from an Islamic approach. Because I think that in our philosophy, especially in, in the prepathetic philosophy, philosophers like Avicenna, uh, the whole approach to the issues, philosophical issues, can be called somehow analytic approach. So we have a rich you know, heritage in analytic thought about philosophical issues and we can bring them into action and use them. But I think that even if this is a useful, interesting and uh, essential uh, necessary approach to philosophy of religion, but it is not the single or the unique one. And as I said before, I think that other approaches to philosophy are in themselves valuable. And I think that we should be uh, pluralist in the sense that we allow several, you know, different uh, tastes, different views uh, to, to present themselves and to come into the discourse and dialogue. So I think that uh, actually I am now working uh, on a paper the question is that whether Islamic philosophy can be called an analytic philosophy. And I am wondering to, to say that, for example, uh, Mullah Sadra and, and Hikmat Muta'aliya approach to philosophy is um, completely and uniquely analytic or for example, we can say that, uh, no, uh, also in Mullah Sattva's view, we can find some traces, I can say, of other approaches to philosophy. So I think that we should be methodologically, you know, a pluralist in this sense that they, it, it will help us to to enlarge our perspective of the issue. Thank you, and, and we certainly look forward to that. Um, I, I, I've noticed at least two questions. Um, if you have questions, can you just let us know in the chat, and then we'll come to you. But let us start with um, uh, Reza Akbari, I think has a couple of uh, questions or comments, and then we'll come to Hacha and Marwari. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you hear me because I am in a village far from Tehran, so my internet connection is not very good. Can you hear me? Who is this? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just wondering who's speaking. Yeah. No, actually, ah, Reza. Ah, I am Reza. Yeah, I am Reza. So I you hear, have my voice? I hear you, Reza. Your voice is clear for oh, me. At thank. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saidimer. Thank you for the points you shared. Uh, I have one question and one comment. My question is about some societies like uh, such the Iranian Society of Religion established in Iran around uh, eight years ago. And I am wondering what do you expect to happen in the future? Uh, I mean, uh, can we have more Islamic philosophy of religion than Christian philosophy of religion regarding having these societies in Iran? And can we put Christians to engage in Islamic problems uh, such as problems of Lutf and problem of Evaz? These problems that I know you are dealing with them. Uh, and some other problems, Dear Sajjad talked about Hinduism. This was my question. Maybe uh, they are two questions. 
And my comment uh, is about the approaches in uh, philosophy of religion in Iran. As Professor Saidimer said, the main approach is analytic, but I want to add that now we have some young scholars in Iran. Uh, they are translating books of European scholars that help to enrich the continental literature. I named some of these professors in the chat, like Professor Bassett, Professor Sefit Khosh from Behisht University, Professor Ardebili uh, from the Institute of Humanities. So maybe we are going toward a balance between analytic and continental approach to philosophy of religion. Thanks. Thank you, Reza, for your comment and question. Regarding your first question, yes, I agree with you that our society or association for philosophy of religion, Iranian association for philosophy of religion can actually play a major role in you know, promoting philosophy of religion, both in Iran and abroad. And as you know, because you have been a very active member of the board of this society during the last years, we try to manage and arrange uh, an international uh, conference on philosophy of religion annually and I think that we succeed to, to uh, held, I think more than eight or about eight conferences during the previous years. And uh, this was a very good uh, event, uh, both in Iran and both, and, and uh, also from the uh, aspect of our international affairs. And I think that in the future, uh, inshallah, we can play a better and more significant role uh, to uh, have dialogue and uh, scientific relations with our counterparts and our colleagues in European countries and in the North America, Britain and other countries who work seriously on philosophy of religion. And as you mentioned, some issues of Islamic theology or Islamic philosophy like Evaz or Bada, I agree with you that, and I tried as far as I could to uh, play a very small role to in, in, in introdu introducing these uh, issues in some international media uh, to, to have, inshallah, some you know, discussions in the future on these issues. So I am very, in a sense, optimistic about the future. And as you mentioned, a new generation shaped and formed in Iran who work seriously on philosophy of religion uh, and from not an analytic uh, perspective, and we should welcome this young, as you said, young scholars, Iranian scholars. And I think that the future will be better. Thank you for your comments. Okay, we, uh, thanks. Uh, we, we had a couple of other questions. Uh, maybe we pursue with Hashem, Hashem Morwari. Uh, Hashem, if you ask Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Saidimer, for the interesting conversation. Thank you. Uh, um, so, um, you mentioned that, um, actually, you suggested that uh, there is a sharp divide uh, in current uh, discussions of philosophy of religion in Iran, and uh, 
I think more globally in the Muslim community, uh, there is a sharp divide between um, um, between what they discuss now and uh, the rich tradition that we have uh, in our Kalam theology and philosophical theology. So for many centuries, um, philosophers and theologians um, were discussing about a wide range of theological issues and the nature of God, relation of God to the world, the nature of prophecy, and many other issues, the relation between morality and Sharia. Um, and we don't see almost any of these uh, discussions in the contemporary philosophy of religion in Iran. Um, so I was wondering uh, what is the explanation for this sharp divide in the first place? And then what uh, what practical steps we can take to uh, bridge this uh, divide. Um, you are amazed when you go and read uh, our, um, uh, our tradition in theology and philosophy, how sophisticated sometimes the arguments are. Uh, and so I wonder why we have left all those rich ideas and views and arguments out uh, in our uh, in our philosophical dis discussion of religion in Iran. Uh, I also had a question about the relevance of analytic approach to Islamic philosophy. I can ask it if there is time later on. Thank you. Thank you, Hashim. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think that let me begin with this point. Uh, as far as I can see about the, you know, uh, status of philosophy, Islamic philosophy today, I think that there are at least, you know, two different uh, views in Iran among the Iranian scholars, as far as I can, could see. Uh, Two extreme, I can say, extreme uh, sides or ends of a spectrum. Uh, one end uh, is that uh, some people, some scholars, especially in our seminaries, I can say, they think that all we need in philosophy has been actually gathered under the label of Islamic philosophy. And they don't care about other schools of philosophy, both, sorry, both in West or and East. And they say that there is just one philosophy in the world, one true philosophy, and it is nothing but Islamic philosophy. This seems to be an extreme and radical, I can say, view about the status of Islamic philosophy. And on the other side of this spectrum, there are some Iranian scholars who think that oh, Islamic philosophy is out of the uh, out of fashion. It's full of confusion, uh, and it is uh, an old-fashioned uh, way of philosophizing. Uh, we have to get rid of this philosophy and just. Uh, go to the Western philosophy, the contemporary Western philosophy. I think that both of these views are false and incorrect. The uh, moderate uh, and acceptable view is that Islamic philosophy is a school or is a combination of some schools of philosophy just or almost similar to other schools of philosophy. And we need a, a, a very uh, active, you know, exchange, I can say. We should introduce our heritage, our uh, philosophy to the West and also to East, 
And also we have to get familiar with the ideas to think about uh, their views and to come to criticize them scientifically, of course, not just emotionally. Uh, and we need some uh, scientific exchange, I can say. So if this is the case, if we accept this uh, view, when we come to philosophy of religion, the situation is almost the same. We have some production to, you know, uh, present them to the West, and they also have some good uh, uh, achievements, I can say, philosophical achievements through the, a long history of philosophy. And we ha have to care about their views, to study them carefully, to become familiar with the basis, with the fundamentals and then go through a discourse and an exchange to finally you know, improve our general or global uh, philosophy, I can say. So it, the, the, there is a lot of work we have to do in the future. And uh, about your wondering, I can say that there are some obstacles uh, which face uh, our attempt to you know, change the situation. One of them is the language, I can say. And unfortunately, by language, I don't mean just English or German. Of course, this is part of what I mean by language. But by language, I mean uh, in a broad sense to have good knowledge of the culture of our uh, non-Muslim, non-Iranian colleagues, and to be familiar with the you know, whole, uh, I can say whole structure of their thought, uh, so that I, we, can, we can introduce our views in, in a way that it could be understandable for them. Understanding is very important. Some people in Iran think that, okay, we can translate, for example, Al-Bedayatul Hikmah or some of works of Mullah Sadra into English or other European languages and uh, present these translations. Okay, they come, other uh, philosophers, Western philosophers, was come and read these translations and become familiar. I, th I think that this is not sufficient at all. And perhaps it's not so useful. And uh, language is very important because many of, this is a very bad point, I can say that, uh, you know, in Iran, the amazing point is that uh, now in Iran, we have a great, I can say, philosophers who uh, work in seminaries, Ayatollahs, great figures. They have a very profound knowledge of Islamic philosophy, uh, but their ideas, unfortunately, have been limited in Iranian borders. Then you go abroad, for example, and someone asks you, okay, who is a very great figure of philosophy, for example, scholar of philosophy in Iran? You answer, okay, we have some great philosophers like Ayatollah Jabadi, Allah Matawat Abayim. Uh, and they are very great, many good ideas. Uh, and then he, he or she asks you, okay, where can I find the papers? Where, where can I find their ideas in my language? In, in this stage, we cannot answer a good, you know, we don't have any good answer to put for this question. So, sorry for 
being uh, long, but I think that one of the obstacles which is very important is the language is broad. We need to be present in international affairs, in conferences, in international journals. Uh, some of us should have the opportunity to teach in the universities abroad, out of Iran. And some uh, words like these. If these obstacles will be removed, we may have a better situation. Can I have a quick follow up, please? Yeah, yeah sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say that um, uh, the, the gap, the, the sharp divide that I said uh, exists not only between our contemporary philosophy of religion and our tradition, but also between uh, the contemporary philosophy of religion and our more primary uh, sources like the Quran, the Hadith. Um, we don't see any philosophical discussion of themes that emerge in the Quran, for example, or in the Hadith, um, subjects that are um, um, particular to particular, particularly Islamic. Well, there is a large portion of um, the, the philosophy of religion that is practiced um, in, in the West uh, that is common, is shared by Islamic tradition, but there are subjects, issues, themes that uh, are Islamic, uh, such as the conception or notion of prophecy in Islam, which is different from Christianity, uh, or the or imamat, features of imam, or Dr. Akbari mentioned uh, the principle of lutf. Uh, we don't see it, even the, any discussion on these issues uh, in our philosophy of religion. So the divide is not only between our tradition, our secondary, uh, uh, secondary source uh, and us, but also between the primary source, the Quran, the Hadith, and uh, our contemporary philosophy of religion. Yes, I, I agree with you. But I, uh, I'm, I would say that we, as far as I can understand, we should first find the, the problems, what are the actual problems, and then try to solve these problems. <sighs> What are the, I can say, causes for, for this divide, as you mentioned? Why me as a Muslim philosopher, someone who likes philosophy, uh, why I didn't or I actually don't care much about my tradition? And I am very impressed by Western philosophy and so far from my background in Islamic philosophy. What's the problem? What are the causes of this situation? We should first uh, um, get a uh, knowledge of these pro uh, problems, these causes, and then try to solve the problems. Okay, uh, thanks. Um... I'm worried about going too long, so uh, let's go forward with uh, with Mansoura. Mansoura, you, you also have a question. Please, uh, please uh, stick to one question. Sorry for uh, yes, I <laughs> being <can't>. limited. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your presentation, which was very um, interesting and uh, informative. Um, uh, at the beginning, you talked about the critical way of thought in Hosa. It, Last time I also posed a question about Hosa, but it, uh, it is exactly the field I'm uh, working now on. Um, um, it is very interesting what you said, and it is sort of um, astonishing for me because it happens very rarely that we uh, hear a different voice from Hosa. I'm not talking about someone like 
for example, Alama Taba Tabai, which I don't understand why we shouldn't have someone like him now uh, who worked on uh, his um, actual, I mean, uh, on the actual problems of society, for example, Marxism that time with Motahari. Um, uh, but even someone with Motahari who uh, thought critically about the economical and uh, educational structures of who that there isn't, or I don't know at least. And in a sort, um, my, my very general uh, picture, my very general understanding of this whole tradition is that we came to 16th century with Sadra, the tradition was very productive, very alive, and especially in Isfahan school, and afterwards, we just are repeating it without to question it. I mean, for example, the main question of Esalat Wujud and Esalat Mahiyat, we have repeat, we, we are repeating it since four uh, century and we are not thinking about leaving this structure of thought and to propose a new structure. And even we are not fundamentally asking what it is about at all. I mean, for example, I personally, I can very good understand what's the uh, problem between idealism and realism in uh, European philosophy, but I don't exactly, I don't understand very well why Iranian philosophers so long and so intensively debated on the problem of Esalat um, Wujud and Esalat Mahiyat. I've been writing an article on this uh, topic and at the end, I don't have the impression that I've been successful for myself. I mean, it is not very clear still for me. So why we, I, I mean, how do you see that? Why we stopped to, when I, um, I, I as I would uh, borrow the concept of uh, Syrian intellectual, we just stop to recycle our thought and we just repeated it. I very much believe that this tradition has a lot to offer. I, I, I wonder why we didn't, for example, develop something like uh, psychoanalysis in our tradition because the mystical texts, they are very profound analytic uh, analysis of human nature. In our tradition, uh, I mean, in the Hosa, mm, the psychology is the same like 10 uh, century ago, or, um, or Ghazali. Ghazali's critique of causality is the same words like Hume. Why philosopher, I mean, in Hosa didn't take him serious. Uh, I, well, I, I just would like to know how do you think, uh, how do you see it if, when you say that they have a very critical way of thought? Why we don't see the result of it? Why they think in sort of a standard way, they have a one way of thinking and we, they don't try to, 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 to pass the borders to... Thank you. Thank you for your good question. Uh, actually, I think that very much should or could say answering your question, and we have, uh, of course, not enough time to. But unfortunately, we have not enough time. Just two minutes. How many? <laughs> How many minutes do we have time? Um, I, I, it's, I know, entirely, it's entirely up to you. I, I just think um, if we do this and maybe one more question, and then we should probably bring it to close, just because it's been quite long. But it's uh, it's you know it's entirely up to you. We're fine. We can continue now. I I, I try to be very brief. First of all, you know about uh, the nature of philosophy. There is a view which is somehow common still now among some Jose scholars, as far as I could understand. And it is that, uh, you know, philosophy is not, uh, is, is, is unique and is one, you know, we have one philosophy in the world and in the history 
throughout the history. And according to this view, you know, you know, we don't need, I mean, it's, it, it's not, it's not good and not necessary to revise every day our, you know, ancient views, because according to this view, we have one truth in the universe and philosophy is going to disclose this one unique uh, uh, truth. And since the truth is single and one, your understanding of truth would be in a sense uh, one and you cannot have many different understandings of the single truth. According to this view, I don't believe in this view, but some people do according to this view, it's not good because some people think that a merit of Western philosophy is that in any century or in uh, every year you find a new philosopher with, with a basically different ideas from you know other philosophers. Uh, uh, my point is that this is a point for uh, thinking, contemplating. Uh, what, what is the nature of philosophy? And is it good for, for philosophy to gradually and rapidly we change the ideas or not? This is one point. And the second point is that uh, at any rate, we think that uh, philosophical questions are different from scientific questions. Uh, philosophical problems or questions are very profound, very deep and they don't have a short date, you know. So when we, you talk about asalat wujud even if the term is somehow old, but you can have new understanding of this issue. At any rate, the problem of existence is, have, has been and now is and in the future will be important for a philosopher. What we need is not to get rid of metaphysical uh, questions like questions regarding the nature of wujud and existence. What we need is to uh, uh, contemplate on the answers to these profound questions and try to revise the answers and to propose uh, more uh, profound, deeper answers are, uh, in a sense, better answers. So uh, this is my view. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, you, your question is very broad. You know, it needs much time to be discussed. Yeah, thanks. Uh, may maybe the last question we have Mariam Kharatman to ask one of her questions, if you let me. Um, the first question is, does philosophy of religion practicing in Iran deal with minor religions, including Zoroastrianism and Judaism? Uh, maybe you can say a, a little bit about this. What do you mean uh, by deal, dealing with? Uh, is, is there kind of, uh, kind of working with, in, in philosophy of religion, working with ideas in Zoroastrianism or Judaism or not? To be honest, I I haven't seen any good work on these issues in relation to Zoroastrianism. But according to a philosophical rule, if you didn't find something, this is not a sign or good evidence of the non-existence of that thing. Adam was Adam el Wujud. But as far as I Remember, I couldn't find any good work on this issue. And this is a shortcoming, of course. And doesn't that actually indicate like a problem in philosophy of religion, which is that, for example, if we look at the United States or Britain, philosophy of religion is really philosophy of Christian understandings of religion. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in Iran, 
philosophy of religion is the philosophy of sort of Islamic or Shi'i understandings of religion. And so it's not, in neither case are they truly philosophy of religion. Is this your question or your idea, Sajid? <laughs> this is your idea or this is your question? Oh. Uh, do you hear me, Sajid? Sajid, Sajid you're muted. Yeah, no, I was just saying that this seems to me the case that um, neither in, in, in North America nor in Iran do you actually have proper philosophy of religion. In one case, it's basically philosophy of Christianity. In the other case, it's basically philosophy of, of Shi'i Islam. Um, and or actually, in the former case, I would say it's either philosophy of Calvinist Calvinism or philosophy of Catholicism. And in the second case, it's um, philosophy of, of Shi'i Islam. But I, uh, I can agree with you just partially, you know, not completely, because I think that uh, you are right. 50% you are right in, in the United States, in the Europe. We can say that uh, the philosophy of religion is Eurocentric in, in its essence. There. Yeah. Uh, because they don't are familiar with Islamic views or they, they don't care sometimes about these views. But I think that in Iran, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, many of the students and even the scholars, sometimes they are more familiar to, for example, Plantinga or uh, Swinburne or, or New Thomists more familiar to them than to Mullah Sadra or Khaja Nasir and the like. So I think that uh, uh, comparing to them, we are uh, more affected, I, I can say, by their idea and more absorbed, you know, in their ideas. And uh, I think that it is not uh, an equal you know, situation, as you said, so that they are Christian, uh, work on Christian philosophy religion, and we are mostly concerned with Shiite. The first point is <laughs> completely correct, I think, but the second is somehow different, I think. And this is, uh, from one point, this is a weakness in our work. As Hashem mentioned, a division between our tradition and uh, what nowadays we work on. Thank you. I, I think we should probably bring it to a close and I will stop recording. Um,